What's up, everyone? Today, I had the pleasure to chat with American country Americana singer, songwriter, member, three times lady trio, and Caroline Pine duo, Kennedy Scott. In this newest episode, Kennedy talked about being inspired by her grandfather, folk Billy musical style, upcoming first solo project produced by Mo Pitney, admiration for Nancy Griffith, Amy Lou Harris, three times lady trio, the creation of Caroline Pine duo, first final she ever owned, social media's influence on music, a battle that she's fighting but hasn't told anyone, what younger self would be happy or sad about her today, favorite meal to have, and more. Now, with that being said, hope you enjoy my conversation with Kennedy. Hello, Kennedy. Hey, how's it going? It's 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 going amazing. Um, you know, um, I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about with you, and and a lot of things to catch up on. Um, but first and foremost, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I've been um busy, like you said, with all of the all of the projects, duo, trio, solo stuff. Um, but it's the good kind of busy, the kind of busy I've prayed for. So I'm doing good. Absolutely, absolutely. And and um, I, I mean, I mean, how's I guess, I guess, how is the married life going? No, married life is amazing. Um, I have been blessed with a husband that uh, is really good to me. And um, I know that people say, oh, your life's over when you get married. And they joke about that sort of thing. But it kind of feels like my life started when I got married. And I feel the complete opposite about that. So I, lo- I love it. It's great. Absolutely. And um uh, tell us about like a little bit about your your background and sort of how you first got into music. Yeah, um, I love all sorts of music, uh, and I can thank my grandfather for that. He's the one who taught me to play and sing, um, and he loved a lot of Roger Miller, Amy Lou Harris, which is what you hear me sing in the trio. Um, so it's a dream come true for me to to sing some of my heroes' music. Um, and he taught me to play and sing, and he was in a band traveling around upstate New York for as long as I can remember. So I've been on stages since I was, gosh, I don't know, three years old, it feels like. Absolutely. And uh, Amy Lou Harris, who just celebrated her birthday as well. Um, so happy belated birthday to Amy Lou Harris. Um, it's incredible how how long that some artists can go for in their careers. Um, and she's still going um, and going strong still, even with Vince Gill and, um, I mean, George Strait uh, and Alan Jackson. Um, and, and the CMT Music Awards was just held uh, recently as well. Did you watch any of the CMT Music Awards? Yeah, I did. I watched a little bit. Um, and uh, it's just crazy how country music has come along. Um and to think it's as big as it is now, because when Amy Lou Harris was doing country music and, and people before her, sometimes it wasn't even seemed as cool. Uh, and now it's cool to be a country music fan. And and I love that. Was there any fa- favorite performances that you, you took from that night? I think everybody did a great job. Um, I really don't think anybody could have done better than one or the other. Um, I love everybody in country music now and, I think this day and age, we're getting a mix of older country music starting to come back um, and traditional country music starting to come back. And I just love Lainey Wilson so much. I think that she is she's really bringing some of the the things that Dolly brought to the table back to to country music. And um, yeah, I think they all did great. Absolutely. And, you know, I was I was, you know, watching the CMT Awards. you know, there's so many storylines from that night that I will take away. Um, one being Jelly Roll. Jelly Roll really took over that night. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I, you know, something about Jelly Roll cracks me up. Um, and, you know, his his award, like acceptance speeches, are the most legendary thing you'll ever see in your lifetime. Um, but also, I feel like there was a lot of um, a lot of honorable mentions, I guess, for Shania Twain. Um, yeah. there was, there was that surprise performance with Alanis Morissette doing, uh, you ought to know, uh, with yeah. Andy Wilson and all sorts of different, uh, female artists. Then there was Leonard Skinner's, uh, Sweet Home Alabama and Simple Man, uh, tribute, which was really cool to see. Um, I mean, for me, I think watching that, there was a lot of performances that really stuck out to me. I thought the opening was, uh, pretty cool too. I like Tyler Hubbard's. Uh, yeah. dancing in the country as well um and also long neck way to go john party and midland that was really cool to see as well 
Um, Midland's my favorite. I love them so much. I think he sounds like Dwight Yoakam, the lead singer of Midland, and he's got that cool neo traditional thing. Absolutely, and um, um, I I want to I want to talk about um, uh, I know we just talked about earlier about uh, but like we talked about it briefly about three times Lady Trio, but I want to go more in depth about it because um, you know, this is a group consisting of you, um, Hannah Blaylock. Uh, who I just recently had on, and Lauren Massetti, um, who is also uh, just a really talented artist and and really an amazing person uh, altogether. Um, and she was on American Idol, and that's how I found her. Um, yeah. So t- talk to me about when that sort of clicked in that you guys wanted to become a trio. Um. Okay, so... A few years ago, actually, wow, it was 2018, me and Hannah met, um, and we started doing some music together. We just realized instantly that we grew up on a lot of the same people, a lot of Nancy Griffith and and some of the older country music, and uh, became soul music sisters, and um, we really bonded over the trio records. Like I said, my papa taught me to play and sing, and those trio records were just iconic and everywhere we went and we tried to learn every song that was, that was on them. Um, and me and Hannah shared that. So we decided we wanted to do, wanted to do a trio tribute show. And this was just kind of a dream at the time. And, and we thought we'd learn the songs and we were looking for a Linda Ronstadt. And I had also seen Lauren Massetti online and I told Hannah, I was like, dang, I've got a Linda Ronstadt. She sounds just like Linda and she'd be perfect. And I sent uh, Hannah her Instagram and Hannah was like, oh, that's it. And I messaged Lauren. We had had mutual friends around the country and bluegrass industry. And I messaged her and asked her and she was like, oh my gosh, this is a dream come true. And we just, it was a huge passion project for us. Um, so we started doing those trio tribute shows. We did a rehearsal. We learned all their songs, learned the parts, and just tried to do them justice, which, as you know, is, is hard to do when it's Sammy Lou Harris and Dolly Parton and Linda Ronstadt. Um, but we got together and did those trio shows, and it seemed everybody was all fired up about it, and we kept getting messages and emails and people asking when we're playing again. Um and so it just kind of fell in our lap that we were like, man, we should pursue a trio. It seems like uh, people really want us to do this thing, and we love singing together. Um, so Nana, if you know Nana, Lauren's Nana, she is, you know, our honorary fourth member of the band. We love Nana. Uh, she came up with the name Three Times a Lady. So uh, we started performing as Three Times a Lady and decided we were gonna we were going to write for our own project, record original music. Um, we started We started writing a couple months ago and we're hoping to write for a record and um, record a record and release it under three times the lady, so. Absolutely. Um, and I have to say, uh, three times lady trio, um, such a really uh, cool thing you guys are doing. And um, I, I, I love the content you're putting out there as well. It's it's really cool to see now different, um, I guess, groups or different individuals of all sorts of different sort of calibers of voices coming together to create um, a harmonious uh, group called Three Times a Lady Trio. If you haven't already, go follow them on their socials. They're a wonderful uh, group. Um, and um, there's a funny story about uh, groups, uh, Runaway June especially, um, I was watching the Bobby Bone show and um, they were interviewing Runaway June and their newest member. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't Natalie Stovall. It wasn't the other girl. It was um, it was the one in the middle. I forget who it was. I forget Evie. what her name was. Yes, Evie. Um, Evie. Yeah. yeah, and Natalie kind of told this funny story of how um, we couldn't fall in love with the first person uh, we talked to, but then we ended up, we, we totally did. Um, and... Uh, and it, it so happened to be the same story with you guys. You yeah. found Lauren Massetti online and you probably said in your minds, we can't fall in love with the first person we meet. Um, but you totally did. Um, tell yeah. us about tell us about how you sort of fell in love with Lauren's talent. I think that we were kind of already in love with Lauren, just seeing her online. Um, 
she just has such a cool thing about her. And we had all been fans of each other, which I think is a cool thing about our group is that we're such big fans of each other. And in our solo careers, too, um, we all really respect each other's gifts and what we bring to the table. Um, Lauren's easy to fall in love with it. I mean, it was just if we could have had anybody better, there is no one um, in our minds. So we just we just got lucky. Absolutely, and um, um, I'm I'm actually gonna put the um uh, the video of you guys performing High Sierra live, um, yeah. as a clip um here. me about that sort of video of you guys performing high sierra live what was that like high sierra is one of my favorite ones to um sing live i think that the harmonies are really strong in that song um and uh when i listen to those trio records that's that's one of them my top three that i always remember and think of when i think of the two records that they recorded out of the 24 songs i always think of those memories and in, in high Sierra and even cowgirl, even cowgirls get the blues. You know, those were my top three that I, that I always thought about. And um, we got to do it at third and Lindsley and debut our, our first show as three times a lady. Um, and that's just one of our favorite ones to sing. Absolutely. And I, I got, I was, I was so confused on the group name three times a lady because there was a song by Lionel Richie and the Commodores called Three Times Lady. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> you know, I, I was I was so confused on on whether that was um a group name or that was Lionel Richie's song that um you guys just happened to call yourselves by. Um yeah. was, was that ever like did that ever come into play where where you're just naming the group three three times a lady? Um, but come to find out it's a Lionel Richie and Commodore song that you named the group by. <laughs> Uh, we always knew it was a Lionel Richie song, um, and Nana knew that was a song too. And that title of that song is just so catchy. And when we got up, Lauren wanted to call us the three non blondes, which would also have been pretty funny, um, you know, because of the four non blondes group, um, and we're all brunette girls. But uh, three times a lady just stuck. I mean, Nana said it, and immediately we were like, "That's it. We love it." And uh, yeah, so it doesn't hurt that it was a Lionel Richie song. We love him too. Absolutely, and we have to talk about Mo Pitney and your upcoming projects that you're working on. Um, are you releasing an album soon, or are you working on it? Yeah, we're in the studio. Um, so we've been writing for this project. I've been writing with Mo um, pretty often. Um, writing with a guy named Bobby Tom Tomberlin, um, and lots of other great writers. Writing with Lauren. Writing with Hannah. Um, and we started writing for this project. It's my first solo one. So I was writing with Mo and was like, man, I need somebody to help tell my story. I've never told my story before as a solo artist, as who I am and introduce the world to the kind of art that I like to make. And, um, Mo just seemed like the perfect fit. And I asked him, I was like, man, will you produce my record and, and help me tell this story to the world? Um, and this is his first production that he's ever done as a producer. Um, so he took it on and he's just flown with it. We're in the studio uh, at Jim Moose Browns. Um, he's great in, in his own right and great keys player and singer and amazing songwriter. Um, and we've been over there recording. We're almost finished with three songs and hoping to get seven and hoping to get them released maybe by the end of the summer. Absolutely. Do you have a favorite Mo Pitney song that comes to mind? I have two favorite Mo Pitney songs, I think. Um, actually, maybe three. Uh, I grew up on a lot of gospel music. I grew up singing in the church. And um, so I'm always drawn to gospel music. And I think his his Give Me Jesus is just one of the best versions I've heard. But as far as songs that he released that were original songs, um, 
he didn't write this one, I don't believe, but he recorded a song called It's Just a Dog. And have you heard that one? No, I have not. Oh, you've got to listen to that one. It is so good. It makes me cry every time. If you've had a dog that you love, you will understand. Um, but and then there's another one that's just amazing. It's called a uh, clean up on aisle five. So if you've not heard that one either, clean up on aisle five should definitely be on on your list of going down the Mo Pitney rabbit hole on his on his record. Actually, um, I I have his album um, called Ain't Looking Back, Mo Pitney. Um, and one of my favorite songs is the first song on the album, uh, "A Music Man," is probably yeah. one of my favorites um, on that album. Um, and he basically talks about if people don't know what that song is, Mo Pitney kind of just talks about you know he didn't want the spotlight to be put on him. Um, he didn't come here just because he wanted the payments. Um, yeah. he didn't want he didn't want his name in lights. He just wanted to play guitar and and sing his message and. And and for people, when he leaves this world, uh, to hear that this is what he wants to write as a music man, um, and so that's that's just such a poignant song. I felt. Um, yeah. And is there any songs that you could tell people that have been personal to you that you're writing right now that you're excited for people to hear? Yeah. Um... There's one song, especially on my record, that I'm really excited to to finally put out into the world. Um, it's called Mary Magdalene. And uh, where I got the song is I came into a writing session. And when I was really young, my oldest brother got addicted to heroin and, and drugs. And, and there's a disciple in the Bible. Her name is Mary Magdalene. And she was possessed by seven demons. And uh, even still, when Jesus set her free, it kind of seemed like the disciples didn't want her around. Uh, they always thought that she was going to fall and fail. And uh, she was kind of a flight risk because of her past. They never let it go. Um, and if you grow up in a small town and, and you do something, even though my brother is clean now, it kind of seems like people hold you to two the things that you've done um, in the past. And And so we wrote a song called Mary Magdalene on how how they they remind me of each other and uh and being set free by Jesus. So I'm really excited for people to hear that one. Of course, of course. And um we have to also talk about um your musical sound because a lot of people say they're a country sound, they're Americana sound, but your sound is I guess defined as folkability or folkabilly. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's okay for people let's let's make this into broader context it's not hillbilly first and foremost um it's folkabilly why was folkabilly sort of the i guess the definition of your sound um i grew up on a lot of folk music i grew up on a lot of nancy griffith but i also grew up on a lot of bluegrass um, and so while I don't really sing bluegrass music, I love it. And it's been a part of my soul since I was young. Um, and so it's folk music. And so it's, I'm not bluegrass and I'm not country and, uh, maybe somewhere along the Americana lines, but mixing folk and bluegrass influences and, and the Graham Parsons and Amy Lou Harris influences, uh, most people said it sound like folkabilly and that just stuck. Absolutely. <laughs> Um uh and, and I I find that a really hilarious uh <laughs> to call it folkabilly. Um that takes a lot of guts to call it folkabilly. Um, yeah. uh and, and so we have to talk about also your duo, Carolina Pine. When did that first come about for you? It was twenty sixteen when I met Woody James. He is the the guy in the duo. Um and he came down and at this time I was playing on Broadway in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and he came down and he saw me and I was uh, in front of the Ryman stage and he introduced himself and then came and saw me sing that day. And I was singing a Porter Wagner song um, called Making Plans, which actually Hannah sings in the trio. Um, and he was like, hey, would you would you want to do a, a duet with me on a video and we'll post it on YouTube? And we did. And I think it got hundreds of thousands of thousands of views and at the time we were just getting started and we were like wow that's amazing we've never had that sort of reach and um we kind of just fell into it it was easy to sing together I think in music you just meet people that you melt with and um that you blend with and it's not hard 
it's easy. Um, and as soon as you find something easy to make that sort of magic with, I think you just stick with it. And uh, that's what we did. And he's actually going to come over this week and we're going to work on some some new stuff, too. So uh, we're excited to do some more Carolina Pine stuff as well. For sure. And um, I was I was also, you know, you're talking about meeting different people at certain points in your life. And um, you ended up meeting Hannah, you ended up meeting uh, Lauren, and then you ended up meeting Mo Pitney. Um, and then you obviously met um, his wife, Emily Pitney. Um, yeah. And you guys performed a new original song called Shadows. There was there's so many things that stuck out to me um about I guess your career wise, but something that's important to talk about is I guess did you have a name change or something regarding I got the name married. change? Yeah, when I got married, um I took my husband's last name, Scott. Yeah, because I was I was actually like confused about whether or not um, there was a name change before the marriage or was it after, but now getting the clarification that makes total sense because yeah. before you were named Kennedy Fitzsimmons and now you are Kennedy Scott. Um, yeah. It, there was, was that just always something in the back of your mind to, to take your husband's last name or was, was that just something that came about? Yeah. I've always wanted to take my husband's last name. I've, I've always wanted to, to be a family unit with my family. Um, and when I was thinking about changing my name for my career, I thought it might be a little confusing. And and everybody that I talked to said, no, Scott, so much easier anyway. It's better for your career to, to have an easier name and people will pronounce it and remember it. So, um, yeah, it was a, it was an easy decision. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, I've I've, I've talked with uh, one person whose name is Stephen Michael Kabakis. He's a Canadian Elvis impersonator. Um Cool. And, and um, I was asking him about his identity because he changed his name. He went from Stephen Michael Michaels Kabakis to just Steve Michaels. And I asked him why, you know, was, was that ever just something you wanted to change your identity with? Um, or was it just something that just wanted you for, I guess, for you to reintroduce yourself, I guess, as, as an artist or as a person. And I've always felt that was such an interesting question to ask. Um, and now, as as we're talking about your career as a whole, if your younger self met you now, what would make them happy or sad about you today? My, I think my younger self would be really proud of me. Um, I've come a long way in uh, not just in music and in, in uh, honing my craft there, and uh, but I think I've come a long way in a person. I'm seeking out Jesus, and my faith is extremely important to me um the most important thing in in my life and uh i've really tried in the past you know five ten years to just become the person i want to be and uh all that has to do with my faith and i think the younger me would be would be proud that i'm in nashville and and live in my dream and and actually did it and didn't uh, let fear get in my way mm -hmm. and if there was one thing that i guess that was something painful that you've been told in your career, what would that be? Painful. Um, there's a lot of pain in this career. There's a lot of people in this, in this career. It's funny if you post videos online and, and you just get haters, people just hate on those videos. And, and sometimes they're really great and really nice. And, and, um, I think the hardest thing in this career to hear is no. Um, but a lot of times that no becomes a blessing. Any times that I've, I've heard no in my career, I've started a trio or I've, or something better has come. So no is, no is just as important, even though it stings a little bit. Absolutely. And, um, 
you know, there's there's also this important thing about social media platforms and how that sort of changed the whole game of music or anything. Um, but in particular music, uh, wh- how do you see social media and how it's sort of influenced a lot of what's happening now in the music industry? Social media is good in the way of people. I wouldn't be able to, we probably wouldn't have found each other and been able to have this conversation if it wasn't for the reach that social media gives. Um, selfishly, I do miss the days when, you know, you can fantasize about Willie Nelson playing in bars and some record label executive coming in to see him and then he gets famous, you know, and the lights turn on and he he hits the big stage and that is definitely something I romanticize about of those times that I think that I miss. But um, social media has given me a lot of things. I met Lauren through social media. Um, I always joke on stage that she's the best thing I found online. <laughs> um, but uh, I've met so many just talented people through social media and you get to hear all sorts of music of all different cultures if you want to. I mean, it spans worldwide rather than just being American music or or Canadian music or wherever you're from, you get to hear things countries away, which I think is cool. Mm-hmm. And um, um, speaking of music, what was your first vinyl record that you ever owned? The Trio. The Trio was my first vinyl record and it was my papa's and he gave me all of his old records and, and uh, the Trio was his favorite. So it's kind of full circle for me to be doing it three times a lady with, with Lauren and Hannah. Absolutely. You know, I, I have a bunch of records, um, that I own. Um, and you know, there, there's just so many different, I guess, catalogs of music that I'm into, but majority of it, I guess, is country. I mean, there's anything with George Jones to, um, there you go. <laughs> I guess a little bit of Hank. Um, and, but like majority of it, I guess is Vince Gill, a lot of, um, where I guess gravitate towards um, his song, uh, whenever you come around, you know, I, I've I've always adored that story that he told about it, um, you know, about a- Amy Grant and how he first met her. Um, you know, there was they were sitting in a karaoke, I guess, uh, room, and um, he was just like uh, really pretending to be like someone that was really trash at singing, um, and, and, <laughs> and, and 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 he kind of. Um, he kind of changed his name uh, to cover up who he was, um, and he and he would call. Um, he well, he said that his um, wife back then, or girlfriend back then, or a friend, said that um, he called him Willis. Um, he called so, him what? He called him Willis. Willis. Willis, and 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 so and so he um, uh, went to the that um, karaoke place, and he started to sing really bad, and. Um, you know, Amy was kind of like, "Oh my gosh, wh- what am I getting myself into?" Um, <laughs> and then, and then, and then he went Stevie Wonder on her, um, and then, <laughs> and, and then, and then, and then Amy goes, Amy goes, you know, um, what's it called? That's who I know you from. You that Alan Jackson boy. Um, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so that's I guess the story that I remember. Um, uh, Vince, I had never uh, heard that story. Thank you for sharing that with me. That is great. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's a quality story. Um, and as we're wrapping up here, I want to um, uh, really talk about. Um, I mean, there are so many things that we could talk about, but I want to change this up. I want to have some fun here. You know, Hannah has been very clear about posting stories about food that she's made, um, <laughs> and through Vietnamese food or whatever it is. Um, we need to know what is your favorite meal or the best thing that you can cook, um, or your favorite meal that, uh, you actually gravitate towards or favorite cuisine. Well, this is embarrassing. Um, but my favorite meal is chicken and dumplings, <laughs> fried okra and mashed potatoes and gravy from the South Southern. And I love Southern cooking through and through. If I had one last meal, I would go to Cracker Barrel. And I know that sounds so embarrassing, but that's what it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, here in my culture, we do make a lot of dumplings. Um because yeah. that like that's that's our that's our staple. Um and I mean like there's so many things that um that we could choose from, I guess, for favorite cuisine. But 
to me, Vietnamese food is by far my favorite, hands down. Um, yeah. So, I mean, th that's that's really uh, hilarious to see how you know. I've I've always been so interested in in what people eat on a daily basis. Um, and I don't know if this is weird. You know, there are people who can um, enjoy food while while watching something um, that's related to food or somebody eating food while you're eating food yourself, and it makes you hungry. Um, um, do you do you ever find yourself doing something like that? Oh yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not really too picky. I love all sorts of food. So if a good commercial comes on, I'm immediately hungry. <laughs> absolutely. Do you watch a Southern Weekend? No. What is the Southern Weekend? Um, it's it's with uh, Molly McKinney and Natalie Stovall. They go to different places in the South and they just try the different. Uh, food oh. in the south and they uh, basically travel to different um I like interesting places where people wouldn't go necessarily in the south and to learn about the history about it um yeah. you should you should definitely watch it it's really good um that's what i watch uh when it comes to food i guess southern weekend you know they went to alabama um I, I, they went to old red uh blake's blake shelton's honky tonk um i mean there's so many things and this is his last season as a voice coach uh, for Blake Shelton. Is there a favorite Blake Shelton that you kind of gravitate towards? Just one of his favorite songs. Um, I loved all of his old stuff. I'm trying to think of some of my favorites from his old stuff. Um, his new stuff. I love the... Um, What is that? God made a country song. Gosh, what is it? It always gets me fired up. God's country. Yes, yes. I love that song. Every time I hear it, I'm instantly in a good mood. And I know it's it's probably not one of his more popular ones, but uh, I love that song. And it, all of his old stuff was great. Even the stuff that he wrote um, with Miranda for for whenever his brother passed. Um. And. Uh, I forget that what that one's called too. Um, either way, I love all of his stuff. I'm sad that he's leaving the voice. I think that he was a giant part of that show. For sure, for sure. Um, and yeah, I mean Blake's Blake's been a staple on that show for a, a long time now. Um, yeah. it, it is sad to see him go, but I think you know it, it was right for him to to really set aside that chapter and sort of open up and and spend more time with the family. I think that's important. Um, to yeah. note as well. Um, so here's a question that I've never asked somebody on this podcast, but I'm going to start asking it now because I felt it's a good question to ask. Uh, what is a battle you're fighting that you haven't told anybody? A battle that I'm fighting? A battle that you're fighting, I guess, it doesn't have to be with sicknesses or anything like that, but something, yeah. I guess, a battle in general that you're fighting that you don't necessarily tell anybody about. Yeah. Um, I think the battle that comes easily for me, unfortunately, and, and also easily for anybody in this career is um, imposter syndrome, which is just when successes come your way, like with the trio and and the successes I've had with Woody when we went um, and opened up for Alan Jackson and and uh, you you think that you're not worth that. And you, you think, how did I trick myself into getting here? I'm not actually that good. And and uh, imposter syndrome is, is something you kind of got to overcome in this business because you, you have to believe in yourself or, or nobody else will believe in you. And, and um, yeah, so it's a struggle to think that you're worth what's coming to you, but, but there's a reason why you're there. And so I have to have to tell myself that a lot. Absolutely. Um, uh, my last few questions to you um, is um, these questions have challenged almost every single person that's come on this podcast. Um, yeah. So I'm going to ask you it now. Um, if there was, I guess, if there was anybody that you would play a song with in heaven who's already there, who would it be and what song would you play? It would be my papa. Um, my papa passed right when I moved to Nashville, um, and he was the reason why I came to Nashville. He he uh, always told me I needed to come here because that's where the country music was. And and the song that we always did out was Old Yellow Moon by uh, Amy Lou Harris and Ronnie Crow. Absolutely. Um, and what's, what is the most powerful, immersive, and out-of-body experience that you've had in music? 
out of body experience. Um, I think the most powerful experience that I've had was playing an arena show. Um, me and Woody and Carolina Pine got to open up for Alan Jackson. Uh, one of the shows was in New Orleans. And that stage exactly was where I had first seen Dolly Parton live um, and got to meet her backstage. And, and it was surreal for me to play the same stage that she had played um, just a few years prior. And I'd watched her from the audience and, and standing on that same stage when I watched her on that stage was, was wild. It was Absolutely. pretty cool. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's the end of our time together, but thank you so much for chatting with me. I had such a blast to, um, to really learn about your, your life growing up and, and everything that you've, you've been doing so far. Um, to the listeners who've been, uh, who made it this far into the episode, thanks so much for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with American country Americana singer songwriter and three times a lady trio member and member of Carolina Pine duo, um, Kennedy Scott. You can connect with Kennedy on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or on TikTok. You can help support my show. Please feel free to share with family, friends, or on social media. You can find me on all podcast streaming platforms as well on social medias. Um, I've been your host, Shigby Keltsang. Thanks for tuning into the show. Mm-hmm.